Everyone, happy long Labor Day uh, weekend and welcome to uh, this Hemingway Society webinar roundtable on uh, Young Hemingway, The Path to Paris. I'm Michael Von Cannon and am uh, delighted, uh, nay thrilled, uh, to be joined by the guests that you see before you today. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, I want to review some of the basic uh, details and guidelines for today's session. Uh, first, uh, this is, of course, a webinar, so you're going to uh, see and hear us, but we will not uh, be able to see uh, or hear you. So there are a few ways uh, that you can participate uh, and communicate. Uh, one of those uh, ways is through the chat function uh, down the lower part of your uh, screen. Uh, there should be a chat uh, feature there, and that's to give you space to comment and uh, obviously chat with each other. The second uh, uh, function is the Q&A a feature uh, that can be used to send questions uh, to panelists. And throughout the webinar, um, I'm going to integrate as smoothly um, or as rockily uh, as possible uh, your questions uh, for our panelists uh, today. Also, I wanted to let you know, uh, you might be uh, seeing that on your screen, that we are recording our session. So the Hemingway friends who cannot be here with us in real time uh, can certainly enjoy uh, this discussion after the fact. Today, I'd like to welcome George A. Colburn, uh, who is a historian uh, who's worked extensively as a multimedia distance education programming director and as an independent documentary filmmaker. His films include Ike, The Making of an American Hero, 1941 to 1945, Navajo Code, Code Talkers, A Journey of Remembrance, and last, but certainly the reason uh, we are all here today uh, the Illuminating Young Hemingway, The Path to Paris. Uh, secondly, uh, Robin Lee Berry, a 40-year resident of Northern Lower Michigan, is an eclectic singer-songwriter and accomplished guitar player with several independent recordings of original work to her credit. She's also the co-owner of Freshwater Art Gallery and Concert Venue in Boyne City, Michigan, and she's written the theme song for Young Hemingway, a song entitled Gone Wild, and we will hear uh, Robin uh, play that. Uh, shortly. And thirdly, uh, Robert Trogdon is chair of the English department at Kent State University and a leading scholar of 20th century American literature and textual editing. He has published extensively on the works of Hemingway. He serves as an editor of the Cambridge edition of the Letters of Ernest Hemingway and has most recently edited the Library of America edition of Ernest Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises, and other writings 1918 to 1926. Welcome, everyone. Hey. Glad to be here. Nice to be here as well. I, I would like to start, if we could, uh, with George. We, we enjoyed the film uh, yesterday during stream day. Um, can you give us a bit of the backstory uh, on the film? How did the project come to be? How did it start as an idea? How did that idea uh, actually materialize? Okay, it's a very long story beginning in 2012 when the uh, Hemingway Society met for the first time in Petoskey and the nearby community of Bayview. And um, I have had a home up here, uh, up here meaning northern, lower Michigan, northwest corner, um, since the 1970s when I I uh, finished my PhD at Michigan State in history. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I never, even though Windermere was a few miles away, I, um, I, I never took a great interest in Windermere and the Hemingway story as it connected with this area. Um, until I read that Windermere was going to be uh, taken apart and put back together by Ernie Mainland, uh, Hemingway's um, nephew and uh, son of Sonny uh, Hemingway. And uh, I didn't know Ernie Mainland, but I asked some people up here about um, getting in touch with him because as a historian, I was uh, going to offer my crew 
uh, from downstate to record the before and after on it. And I mean, was very happy um, to take my author um, and um, we spent an entire day shooting the old um, uh, the old wind in there. I'm going to guess somewhere maybe uh, 96, 97. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact date. At my age, everything kind of merges into <laughs> decades instead of years. But um, so we uh, recorded it, and I was terribly impressed with um, Ernie's knowledge of the history of Hemingway as it related to that structure. He would never admit he was a, um, a Hemingway um, uh, expert, but he says, I know everything about this house. And over my shoulder, we recorded him narrating interior and exterior. And as I recall, it took much of the day for us to do that too. And it was three or four years later, we came back and recorded the changes he had made, what he had kept from the um, the old building. And I turned over the tapes and I said, do with these what you want. And it turned out, I didn't know this. I assumed it would go to the historical society up here. But he put it in his personal um, um safe in his home and in late 2011 he said he called me up and uh said maybe it's time to take these tapes out of the safe and i said why is that and he said well he said um the hemingway society is coming up here uh next summer for their annual meeting again i did not get all excited about the Hemingway uh, Society doing um, uh, it's what it does every other year. Um, uh, I took it under advisement, shared that with a friend of mine, another uh, a retired professor with more interest in Hemingway than me. And he said, wow, this is a great opportunity. They're coming up here. And for me, he was talking to me as a producer because when you can get a whole bunch of experts coming to one place, paying their airfare, paying their uh, hotel, it's a bonanza. And uh, I admitted that it was a great opportunity, but it still cost money that I didn't have. And he asked, well, what kind of money by the cost and I said oh ten or fifteen thousand dollars for us to shoot it to edit something that made sense and share it with the um, uh, people at the uh, uh, conference before they left um, and he said well I think I can find that money over amongst my neighbors in Harbor Springs and my recollection, again, memory, not the greatest, but in a matter of days, he said, I got the money. So that <clears throat> put the onus on me to play producer and to set up interviews. I did, my recollection is I did 12 interviews um, in uh, uh, three days, uh, which um, is testing your ability as an uh, interviewer, but, you know, I've made my living doing that, and even though I was no expert on Hemingway, I had certainly done some preliminary uh, editing, but, for example, the uh, Robert Trogdens of the world, I when I interviewed him, um, you know, I didn't know his expertise and so on, so um, but we did the interviews. We went immediately into the uh, studio after the third night in the afternoon of the 
of the fourth uh, day, well, I think it was the last item on the conference schedule, we showed what we call select, you know, highlights of our images. So, and that went well. Everybody thought it was great. And my plan was to donate it to the Hemingway Society or the local um, uh, the local uh, historical society, um, uh, but and be done with it. And um, but again, um, uh, Professor Marshall um, was insistent that we try to get some money, and so we wrote some proposals, and pretty soon we had some money. Um, the local uh, organizations and individuals um, came up with a few bucks each, and pretty soon we had enough money to go places and film, like Penn State, uh, or um, film people like Professor Trogdon uh, on location in Horton Bay. So that's the, the backstory. It was a mistake. Um, and uh, but once, once I had the idea, and it came very early on, um, once I had the idea, there was a story here that clearly had not been told adequately in um, uh, audiovisual terms. Um, the story of Hemingway, what do you call it, 20 summers or 21 summers, or portions thereof in northern Michigan. Ah, I need to correct myself. We are not in northern Michigan here in the northwest corner of the lower peninsula. I've shown my film once in the UP, an earlier version several years ago, in Escanaba. And it was made very clear to me that I had to change the script. And it was and not referred in northern Michigan. Anyway, that's an aside for those who are watching here. But I, um, uh, once I get, uh, uh, you know, I'm like a dog with a bone, um, you know, I got the bone in my teeth and I said, this is a story worth telling. And every time I did a, a, an interview, which started, as I recall, interviewing Joseph Flora in the lobby of the Stafford Hotel, downtown Petoskey, when he explained to me that this region was truly a character in um, Hemingway's writing that lived down, you know, in all of his writing. And I thought, wow, that is very heavy. So, um, and I had taken enough lit courses as a lit minor um, in my uh, various degrees that um, I said, this is worth digging into. And um, as you all have seen uh, in the film, um, the, uh, it, um, a scholar on the letters project or a, um, even a uh, fictional writer like um, Paula McLean uh, or a creative writer like Paul Henderson. They all admitted the importance of the story, but the importance of that little hamlet uh, called Horton Bay. So I had said very whimsically, and I think I met in my interview in the Horton Bay um, introduction, I, I had told local people, we're going to make Horton Bay the star of the show. And I, that was total whimsy, but it turned out Horton Bay is the star of the show. And um, uh, it's, it's quite amazing to think about it in those and so I think uh, as far as backstory is concerned, it took us nine years to raise money. This could have been done um, much earlier. I have other projects 
that have kept me alive as we bounce from 5,000 there to 5,000 there. And uh, this cut that everyone has seen is a director's cut. And uh, it's what I really like as director. And if I were to license this for broadcast or whatever, they might say, we only want 75 minutes stories, or we only want 60 minutes. So that the next phase is um, for us to take the director's cut and make it ready for distribution, cable, public television, platform, and so on. We have a finished product, but it needs to be fine-tuned to meet standards of those outlets. So uh, anyone out there want to be Come a donor will be happy to accept um, their uh, it, their um, donation, and uh, we've had you know I can't even tell you how many but donations we've had you know as little as two hundred and fifty dollars, and the biggest donation we've had was that very first donation from Packy Offfield. Uh, the Offfield family is very prominent up here in the Harbor Springs area. So there's my pitch, and there's my backstory, and I've talked uh, too much now. I want to pick up on some of the threads, um, but I but I first want to say, you know, watching this film, you start to realize what a massive undertaking it is, and you've talked about the nine years of it, and the nine years of the project, and I'm thinking the nature of footage, the 20 plus interview interviewees, the just the production of the, the from the voiceovers all the way through to uh, Robin, I'm, I'm looking at you in the, the music and how the music is layered in as a refrain throughout. And I'm, I'm wondering, how did you uh, get involved in this project? What did you know about Hemingway uh, before uh, you joined the project? Myself? Very little. Yeah. I knew mm. very little about Hemingway. I knew that he had wandered around up here. There was you know, rumor of that, quite a bit of talk about that. See, I'm in Boyne City, which is um, five miles from Walloon and five miles from Horton Bay. And we have Lake in Boyne City, Lake Charlevoix, that gets you up to Horton Bay, quick walk over to it. All of a sudden I saw a little triangle here. Um, George came to me. This is how I got involved in it. Right? Ah. Go back to answering the real question. George came to me. We've been friends for a couple of decades and um, had done some filming in the past together, which was really extraordinary. But he'd always threatened that he was going to call on me someday to help him out with a song. I want to involve you somewhere, somehow. You know, and you throw that out there and I'm going, that's nice. I'll wake up every day with that hope. He called and he said, I'm, I need a theme song for a uh, a documentary about Hemingway, his youth. I'm going, well, that's great. You know, I like to write songs, but I have nothing to go on. What should I do? What should I, where should I start to understand young Hemingway? And at that point, this is um, the, the project of collecting Hemingway's letters had begun quite a bit further than what was published. I was able to hold in my hand uh, 1906 to 1922, Letters from Ernest Hemingway. It's um. I've got it right here. This was this was the book right here. This is um I guess it's and really grateful for the collection of these letters. There are hand drawn images inside that are hilarious. Um, you know, like can you send me a shirt with longer sleeves? Things like that. You know, it's really it's cute, but it's early in his life up until 1922, and the correspondence goes back and forth between himself and his family and himself and his friends as himself and colleagues and places where he's trying to place himself for work after high school but it was a really interesting view of him and that honestly was what i had to draw a picture of ernie hemingway a young boy the other thing that i had was i live right here where he was wandering around and i'm a heck of a tomboy anyway so a lot about nature being you know in the middle of a stream barefoot with a fly rod just makes me cry with joy i mean that's a beautiful place to be. We know this one. And I know Horton Creek and I lived at the edge of Horton Creek and I've all of these things are all of a sudden coming back to like well, you've been here 
for a reason, retain what you've known about this place, which is a lot of beautiful, a lot of beautiful. But what he's describing in these letters aren't necessarily beautiful. We're 19... 06 to 1920, when he was kind of, well, 18, that he was wandering around up here, this was the tail end of a logging industry. This area was heavily logged like all of Michigan was. The White Family Lumber Company was in charge of that logging. And then that logging brought thousands of people to Boyne City to handle, manu you know, handling the logs, but all the other things that go into trying to live. So this community bumped up really fast into about 10,000 12,000, 15,000 people at its peak. That was a lot of people here in a little teeny tiny town of Boyne City. And in that period of time then too, and the logs are finally gone, there's a lot of people here and the money left. So what we're looking at is Boyne City being an industrial, wow. gritty industrial and now becoming dangerous community, right? This is what he was growing up inside of truly. When we start to go back and look at historical things, I don't know what happens, but sometimes it's like George will say, well, start thinking about, and then people will walk through the door for me as a gentleman named Ed May, Edward May, resident in Boyne City, historical um, plethora, wealth of knowledge, just dumped a bunch of documents on my desk and said, you need to know this. You need to know what was happening back then. You need to know this place was wide open. It was crazy wide open, like the great Northwest Territory, like the gold rush. It was savage here and you need to know about this. So he started just bringing incredible documents. Then once talking about, hey, I might be able to write a theme song for Hemingway, people are starting to talk about, well, my granddaddy said, you know, he used to go fishing with Ernie and they, stories came coming, you know, kept coming. So I started to get a little bit more bit by wanting to know more about Hemingway and what was going on here because of all of a sudden being flooded by the communities, unbeknownst to them, they were feeding this necessity. There's a story, it's a bone. There's a story that needs to be told about him being up here. And as I read these letters and put this song together and kind of contributed what I love about Northern Michigan and the things that he said, I picked up things right out of his book and quoted him. You know, so they're in this song. After we got the song done, then George goes, oh, read the Nick Adams stories. I'm going, hey, that's great. That would be two books I've read about Ernest Hemingway. That'd be great. And then he also said to read um, this book. This is an excellent book. This is one everybody should also read, right? You've seen this out. This is an incredible book. It's nice because it's really from this community speaking. So, um, I started reading the Nick Adams stories and I really, this will be for further conversation down the road here because and in this hour, because I'd like to talk more about it. But I heard the words he put in these letters flying out of the Nick Adams stories quoted. And I'm going, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know? So you're talking about uh, City of Lights and um, they're standing on a depot um, landing, getting ready for the train to come. And they're talking with some, you know, women of the night and the women of the, one of the women of the night says, no, I'm from Mancelona. They weren't in Mancelona on this, you know, this wasn't about Mancelona. This was about the little depot that's right downtown Boyne City. So I started watching through these stories about what else is, what else is going on? Well, in the same light, he says, uh, we'll come in that town at one end and we're going out the other. It smelled like hides and tan bark, big piles of sawdust. It's getting dark. We came in and now that it is dark and it was cold and the puddles of water in the road were freezing at the edges. This is where the tannery was, Boyne City. So this is the other part about the story. We're, we're, we're going to have a part two to you know, Path to Paris, the pre-Path to Paris was the next movie that George and I do. There's more to come. There's more to come and it's exciting. I'm, I've got the bone in my teeth right now to want to know more about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, my part about that was glean from these. He gave me one other assignment and then I'll, I'll hand this over. He told me to, if you're gonna read one more book is to find um, Hemingway in Love and War, hmm. right? And I had to get on a plane and visit my daughter who was um, traveling the world. She was on the other side of the world. There's a half an hour difference in, you know, 12 hours 
time zone change. She was on the other side of the world and she asked me to come visit her. I dropped everything, jumped on the plane, scared to death because I haven't traveled like that. And we spent, you know, three weeks in Thailand. And the day before we were to come back to the airport and, you know, head out, we decided to hit a bookstore in Chiang Mai. And we walk up to, everything's outside, everything's stacked on the, on the corners. There were piles of books, head high in the entryway. And I turn to the left and I look and this is on the top of it, George. This was what was on the top of that pile. And I'm going, you gotta be kidding me. I was expecting it to be in German or something, you know, but it was in English. So I got to bring this home and read this on the flight home. So though that these are really the bare bones of how I got to know Hemingway. Um, I was happy to pass the lyrics of the song, pass the Hemingway Society here in Michigan and have them approve them before I would let that slide out. But I really, I borrowed a lot of his words and I didn't know if I was going to be sued for doing that, but um, really tried to speak of what it must have been like to be here and be that kind of free, that kind of free where mom isn't here anymore after 10, 11 years old. He's out wandering. He was drawn to the lights of Boyne City. He was out there. He's out here right across the lake. I was explaining to Michael as we were speaking earlier was that out this window right here is um, we're kind of being eaten up by trees nowadays, but Lake Charlevoix is down below. And off to the left in your view is going to be where Horton Bay is. I get to see Horton Bay every night and the stars over it. It's kind of neat to be this close. So I feel like I've got some kind of a pulse about him, even though well, and maybe it's, you know, his gender identity issues. Maybe that's why I pick up on it. Good. But I do feel the heart and the soul of the wanderer in the woods at night and what it does to you, how it strengthens you and what it feeds in your, in your desire to reach further and hop into water and follow the stream out to the bigger lake. Mm. You know, I feel it. It's juicy is what we call it. Here. <laughs> well, well, I get to enjoy the view of Horton Bay for, I guess, the next hour, maybe, right? Um, yeah. I know. And I, you know, in a few minutes, I want to think about um, how letters maybe turn into lyrics, like how you are, uh, how you are adapting in that way. And please warm up the guitar because you're going to be playing um, in just a few. And um, you know, Ro Robert, I'm coming to uh, you in just a second, but maybe to get there, I want to ask. And I don't know if it's an unwieldy question, um, but George is getting me to think about something because George, you're talking about how you're, you're talking to. Um, some folks and you're saying um, it's Hemingway in Northern Michigan and they're taking offense to Northern Michigan because it's not Northern Michigan. It's uh, the Northern uh, the or, part, or, region or, of lower Mich uh, of the lo lower peninsula. Right. right. There's a, there's a, there's a way in which uh, obviously um, uh, uh, obviously we're talking about certain regions, uh, uh, certain quadrants of certain uh, parts of a state. Um, and I, as a Floridian, understand this, uh, uh, certainly that my little area of Southwest Florida is, is not uh, Central Florida or Miami or uh, even the Keys. And so I'm wondering, like, Hemingway's Michigan, that area of Michigan, to what extent is it representative of the, the, the state or the broader region? To what extent is there something very specific about that area? And, and, and uh, Robin, you're talking about the timber industry and you're talking about lumber and slashing, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we're going down that path. Um, and, and then the last part of this question that might make it really unwieldy is one of the themes, obviously, of the film is how we're not just talking about real Michigan and we're not just talking about a, a real part of Michigan. We're talking about an imagined Michigan here, Hemingway's imagined Michigan. So I guess I'm asking three kinds of questions here. Where is Hemingway's Michigan um, as a, not just as a geographical point, but also as an imagined uh, kind of place? When you think of that big idea, what are some, what are some things that come to mind? Um, unwieldy, yes. <laughs> um, that was a very, very difficult um, matter, you know, intellectual matter to approach that the imagined Michigan, which the scholars I interviewed brought back to my attention and my knowledge of uh, my newly gained knowledge of the history of the area um, um, was 
it was clear that um, the imagined Michigan was his alone, all right? That what he was uh, growing up in all those summers was a fairly ugly place. And we shot the leavings uh, of um, the stumps and the splashing, brought a uh, scholar up from Michigan State to examine the stumps and tell us a little bit about the, the history of it. Um, so you, uh, and then the whole question of the imagined Michigan, Valerie Hemingway was able to explain a bit about how he went back, not to the real Michigan, but to the imagined Michigan. And in closing the show, I have three slates of commentary where I say that he never left this place he imagined is kind of the idea behind it. But um, it was a writer's imagination and each of us have our own individual imaginations. Um, and uh, so I just dealt with it as best a historian could and a filmmaker could. And I hope people got that. I have shown variations of this film, I'm going to say to at least 20 audiences over the years uh, and gotten feedback that everybody, you know, they were focus groups and trying to make sure that I, um, I was getting through to them and that uh, they got it, I guess you might say. So I did a lot of shooting that maybe the um, other documentarians um, might not do in order to play around with uh, what the scholars had told me about uh, Hemingway and his literary imagination. Uh, it was fascinating in that way. And let me say as an add-on to uh, what Robin had to say, I would not have kept going on this project were it not for the letters project. Because when Ernie Mainland made that call to me, it was about the time that the first uh, volume had come out. And, and Robert, I, you know, I'm going to guess that was maybe November 2011 or that's about that's yeah, it's, it's the fall of 2011 was when the first volume came out. Um, yeah, yeah, but I don't remember the exact date. Well, that 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 um, uh, Ernie encouraged me to visit Penn State, and at at that time and <clears throat> pre-pandemic and all that, I I regularly commuted back and forth to Washington, so I actually was there. Um, uh, there was some kind of a, a event, and I met um, a number of the people involved. I'm not sure you were there, but there, Sam, Sandy Spanier was there, and, and Linda Patterson Miller. And so I, um, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> to have the papers that, as a historian, to have the papers so magnificently annotated that it was, you know, as a historian, I thought I died and gone to heaven. So the project was worth moving forward so I could give a copy to Robin and anyone else involved in the content part. So I'm very beholding to you and the others. It was, um, it's a stunning academic achievement, I think. But I want to say one other thing that made it possible was when I went out on my first serious location shoot in the area, I hired a cameraman who 
use a steady cam uh, so that basically he could walk in the water uh, and film, you know, the creek from uh, low level. Um, the uh, coming of the spring flowers. And near the end of the day, we're across Walloon from um, Windermere on the other side shooting. And he said, George, would you mind if I use my new drone? Mm -hmm. Now, you have to realize I had never dealt with a drone. And uh, so the drone took off, got, and totally changed the composition of the look of the film because it got uh, invented and produced, manufactured at the time I was starting out. So you had the letters, you had the drone, and I had a story idea, and we were off and running. Okay, so now that wasn't answering your question, was it? Did I? Michael, can I can I have have a stab at the unwieldy portion of the question? Absolutely, absolutely. This is a roundtable. Jump in. Okay. Well, it's the funny thing to me is when he's in Michigan, like nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty one. And he's writing these stories, the the stuff that shows up in Peter Griffin's "Along with You," the 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 Wapian Way, and um, the passing of Pickles McCarthy, and and things that the, you know the things that we the the scholars have to have to read because you have to be a completist, you know, and they're they're not any good. It's only when he gets to Paris, really, that he and he starts writing about Michigan that he really breaks through he can't write about michigan there and in a movable feast he talked about the idea that you had to transplant yourself uh that you could write about michigan if you were in paris and you could write about paris if you're in in havana and and in idaho but it's, it doesn't work that way it's the way to sort of uh recreate the landscape and recreate the place but in a, another sense really create um that his michigan the one that's that's maybe a little bit more idealized than the actual michigan of the time was uh because it's leaving out um the huge forest fires or you know they, they've already occurred in uh, um big two-hearted river um, and just remembering, you know, the, the, you know, maybe romanticizing is not exactly the right word, but sort of, uh, selectively remembering certain aspects of, of that time in Michigan. You know, there's that powerful moment. I think it's in the film where Ernie Mainland's talking about how we often get in trouble or can when we're reading Hemingway, uh, because we can take, uh, fact for fiction. Right, and, and, the, and that that plagued Hemingway uh, his entire life too, um, being being read as a writer of fact instead of a writer of truth, uh, which was the other point that Mainland was making that we should be looking for the truth. And this is part of that that bigger point I think uh, that you're uh, making uh, here. Um, and I think George and Robert, in different ways, are are putting together um, something that I think is really interesting, is in that there's a history maybe to the way that Hemingway imagines Paris because he goes there and he writes afterwards and then he will write decades afterwards and that Im imagined Paris, the way he finds truth, not just fact, um, in, uh, through his writing of, uh, of sorry, uh, not of Paris, of Michigan, of ch might change in different ways, whether it's a different idealized uh, 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 picture or uh, portrait of uh, Michigan, and maybe it's different because of the uh, the fact that he has traveled uh, to different countries um, at that point. And so, he, I think one of the yeah. reasons. One of the, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Robert. He's different. He's different mm -hmm. in all of those times, and it's almost like he's re trying to recapture who he was um, so many years ago. I mean, that's definitely true of a movable feast. You know, writing about being the starving young artist in the 20s, 
you know, at the end of his life. Um, he's trying to almost go back and recapture that sense of youth and sense of promise. Hmm. You know, one of, one of the questions that we're getting is why is there maybe this uh, dr- dry spell in his writing about uh, the, about Michigan in the, the, the 30s through, let's say, the early 50s. It's only toward the end that we really start to see this um, uh, return, we might say, to an interest in um, an interest in Michigan uh, via a movable feast. I mean, do you, do you have a do you have a sense of why there might be a kind of trajectory there, or an interest, uh, an ebb and flow in terms of uh, his his interest in uh, Michigan, or the way that it shows up in his writing? The the be- well, the last really prominent Michigan story would be fathers and sons, which is the last story in uh, winter take uh, winter take nothing in 1933. Mm-hmm. So it's the last story that he wrote uh, It's a story that prominently features his father. And in a lot of ways, that story is sort of exercising the memory of his father and, and a way of dealing with uh, Clarence Hemingway's suicide um and an idea and it's an idea that that plays out in for whom the bell tolls with robert jordan's thoughts about his father's suicide um but it's 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 the it's almost as if that then there are other places that become so important spain in in the in the 1930s um is like the predominant thing that is occupying Hemingway's mind with the Spanish Civil War, you know, up through the 1940s. And then you have World War II, which is also sort of dominant and, you know, you get a real dry spell in his writing there. Um, So I think it's a lot about, you know, sort of political and social issues that maybe are occupying his time and just, uh, you know, other places that he loves uh, and that he cares deeply about sort of, you know, coming more to the fore. You know, maybe I could like offer a rollback even on a view of the way he's perceiving Michigan and the way that it pops up in his writing. And I think one of the things that struck me about the letters were that he would write letters home from the hospital bed after he'd been injured. And one of them particularly, I don't have the page pulled up or I would just read it for you, but I remember him Uh, making references to what's getting me through this very painful time is that I'm, I'm remembering every blade of grass along the edge of this creek and underneath this nook is where that brookie's hiding. And he recalled that tirelessly because he was in bed for weeks and weeks and in severe pain. And what he did to, I read it in my, or I interpreted it as that was part of his mending was to go back to this time and idolize every little glisten of light that came through water that dripped off the edge of a a blade of grass and then he ends it with oh those birds at sunset you know to me that was one of the things that helped him pull what was important to himself together and so you in taking that moment and then rolling back to what he was truly experiencing walking around as a young boy there were pockets of beauty that hadn't been completely blown apart had already been say turned into farmland for instance so they weren't the they weren't the um the 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 degradation of what had been cut and burned they weren't large forests so there were still parts of community that were there and beautiful and there were surrounding forests in some of those areas so he had little snippets of this beauty he had along the river where a lot of the trees are cedars and weren't going to be what they cut down at that point anyway He has places, pockets where there are virgin pines still left up in northern Michigan. And there were several times he'd get off the ferry in Ludington and walk up. And in walking up, he'd be hitting things like along the Boardman, different places that have really um, incredible ancient beauty. And I kind of think he took that as this is what I'm always going to be seeking. You know, I'm always going to be looking for these places that are what will become again from what just happened they'll evolve again. I've witnessed them. I've been to the mountain. I've seen them. I know they'll come back. And I think in the last good country, he also makes mention as they're climbing over the slashings to get back into some virgin wood that's up in that Harbor Springs cross cross village area, right? That was still some virgin territory. And he was promising the beauty of all of that. 
So I think he took these little postage stamps of, of undesecrated and held on to those. And, and that's where he found his best joy when he was here anyway. So in all of his writings, that's where everything has to go. You have to witness that cruelty to appreciate the greatness of what was very little of it was left. And he witnessed a lot of that cruelty. Trees being cut down and just the bark taken, for instance, you know, for the tannery. That was, there's, that's like taking hides off of buffalo in some cultures. You know, so there were all of these different things that were ha happening in humanity to man things that were part of nature that he got to see firsthand. He'd smell it. You'd get up into the woods around here and it was just smoke filled. That northern Michigan was covered in smoke for a decade because of all of these fires. Um, I think that's what any writer has to do is to take what's here, assess it, understand what the pearls are, get to the lessons quick and get all the junk out of it so other people can cut through that and get the message faster, better. It's kind of the, the job of a filmmaker. It's the job of a songwriter. It's the job of writing a book is to um, get rid of the fat, get to the facts. Truth matters. <laughs> it matters. And even though he was um, having an imagination that filled up most of his stories, there's still some truth to what he witnessed. He did see the beauty up here. He did see it just in small little bites. One of the things that happened in um, the process of writing this, this song with George is somebody came in to our store in Boyne City, Freshwater Art Gallery. We're right on, in Boyne City, right at the, at the east end of Lake Charlevoix. It's right where all, everything was happening. This young man, well, he was, he, okay, he's as old as me. This old guy came in and he said, you know, I was here, we live in one of the tannery houses or it was, a, no, it was a logging office building that's now a home. He lives in that. And he said, I grew up on the edge of all of this, the slashings and everything. And I know what that was. And I was reading this book down on the shoreline in the sand. And when I finished it, I slapped the book shut and I ran inside and I said, mom, mom, this book, this book sounds like it could have been written about right here. We're going, no kidding. No kidding. What? <laughs> You're talking about remembering every blade of grass to, uh, to get back, right? Yeah. And, you know, one of the days I want to get back to is, is September 3rd, 1921, because, you know, we were watching this film on the 100th anniversary of, obviously, uh, Hemingway and Hadley's wedding anniversary. And I mean, if we could, uh, for a moment, and maybe, uh, Robert, you can take us there. Take us back to Horton Bay 100 years ago. So let's get in a time machine and go back. What was, what was that like? What was Horton Bay like? What were Hadley and young Hemingway alike at that point? What, what did they think their uh, future would hold? Well, it, it struck me is that Hemingway and, and Ernest and Hadley may have invented the destination wedding. <laughs> uh, for for uh, picking out uh, because the obvious place uh, to to marry would have been St. Louis, which was Hadley's home, uh, and after that uh, Oak Park, um, his home. But uh, instead, uh, they picked Horton Bay, which was relatively still, a, I think, roughly the same size. Uh, then as it is now, it was not a very large. I mean, it's it's the, the wedding party co comes in and you basically double, you know, or triple the population um, that's coming in. And, and um, you know, uh, on just Hemingway's side of the wedding party uh, is uh, Jack Pentecost, Hal Jenkins, probably Art Meyer, uh, Dutch Palinthorpe, uh, who is a high school friend, Bill Smith, uh, who shows up in a lot of the stories, Bill Horn, who shows up in, in a few stories, the Jig, uh, Carl Edgar, and Lumen Ra Ramsdale, who's uh, from Petoskey. So this is, you know, I'm not entirely sure how big Hadley's side of the wedding was, um, but um, it's pretty big. And he is, um, uh, he has aspirations to be a fiction writer. He's, he's working uh, still at the cooperative Common Commonwealth in Chicago, which is the shady um, 
uh, organization from the uh, the Commonwealth movement. And and a quick aside, if anyone has 1921 cooperative Commonwealths uh, from Chicago in their their uh, attic somewhere storage, please let me know because this is uh, sort of the second only to our uh, the quest for the lost paris um manuscripts uh and things that i would would like to find but they had uh um uh, hemingway and, and hadley I, I always get a sense that both of them really wanted to get married i think they loved each other but also i think it provided them with an opportunity to escape um and uh both of i mean the the plan was originally for them to go to to italy soon after and uh you know sherwood anderson thankfully you know convinced them to go to to paris afterwards uh but you know he's uh hemingway is not he's looking to be a fiction writer but he's not yet got the courage to sort of cut out from journalism and editorial work uh, for that. Um, they're, you know, just looking at the photos of them, they're very happy, but it seems like it's, um, you know, Hemingway's writing uh, all of his friends up in Horton, uh, in, in the area, looking for a minister um, to, to marry them. And I think part of the reason that, uh, that they go and are married there is because the the place means so much to him uh and it is it is a magical place for him it's the place that he is, is his best friend is you know uh, bill smith is from and bill's uh bill's sister kate um and it's like the best memories that he has are associated with that and i think he you know wants the wedding to be a good memory and to be further associated with that place as well. You know, you, you're talking about these letters. I mean, you're alluding to these letters Hemingway's writing where he's telling people, Hey, come, come to Horton Bay, come, come to the wedding ceremony. And also talking about how they're going to be making plans uh, to go to Italy. Um, right. There's just, you know, I was just reading through there's, one, for example, and there's nothing special about this one, but he's, he says, um, suppose you want to hear all about Hadley. This is July 21st, 21. Well, her nickname is Hash. She's a wonderful tennis player, best pianist I ever heard, and a sort of terribly fine article. And three lines after that, he's talking about wanting to go to Italy. And I'm reflecting on how close we are to having a film called A Path to Italy, right? This is just a, a few months uh, or a month and a half before the wedding, just a few months before they actually head to Paris. We are, I mean, history <laughs> could have, I mean, the, fo the fork in the road is right there, um, is it not, to have, uh, for them to have gone to Italy, right? How, um, Robert, do you reflect on that? Like how close do you think they really would have? Um, he, was, he was supposedly uh, putting some money into Lyra, um, but it was... Uh, it was about a it's it, it as 21 uh as 1921 moved on and especially the the key is is sherwood anderson mm -hmm. the key is sherwood anderson because anderson was was associated with yk smith um and uh anderson um if he had done nothing except uh, or the two, three things that he did that were really important, right? Winesburg, Ohio, help Ernest Hemingway and help William Faulkner. Uh, and, and, you know, and those, those two, and it was really Anderson and in saying that you can live cheap there. There's, you know, uh, Gertrude Stein is there, Ezra Pound. Uh, I'll write you these letters of introduction. Um, it's a, it's a more uh, with the rise of Mussolini and the rise of s sort of the fascist state in Italy, um, that was not going to be a a a hospitable place for Hemingway. Mm. Um, I mean, early on in 1922, Hemingway recognizes 
Mussolini for what he is. And, um, and, but Paris is, is um, going to be, and you know, Paris is much easier to live in for an American or an Englishman anyway, because it was basically uh, an English, an American colony uh, at that point. Uh, in the in the 1920s, you had three English uh, English language newspapers. You had all of these presses and all of these magazines. Um, so it was just uh, more convenial. He wanted to go to Italy because he had been to Italy, um, and mm-hmm. and he knew Milan and he knew that area of Italy, and he did not really know Paris for what it was but once anderson gets there uh it's a pretty sure bet that it's going to be paris rather than milan robin george go ahead well i was just going to say something about um the letters that very early on i thought they were such a gold mine and i want to um say that I was very fortunate giving credit where credit was due. I found a young man who um, had won a scholarship uh, from an organization I'm involved with at our local community college. And I heard him give a talk. So I recruited him as the reader of Young Hemingway Letters. And he did a brilliant job, Joshua McVeigh is his name and the letters became and quotations particularly about the wonders of Port Bay um, were um, a part of the production an important part of the production and I think we would have been uh, we might not have used them had not he been such a good reader so as you're watching the program, Joshua McVeigh reading those letters, Hemingway's words, I think is a terribly important part of it. The other add-on to is Rob, what Robin have, had to say was she is doing some hard uh, historical work right now um, to bring the Boyne City um, that I know it was to life, and it, it just might mean that um, we'll have more to say about Hemingway and uh, Boeing City because there's absolutely no question that these young um, middle to high teen and teens would have gone regularly to hang out at the uh, dark corners of Boyne City uh, back in that day. So um, she's hard at work on that. She has her own project, but I'm quite interested to uh, uh, hear what um, she finds out. I, I have, I'm acquainted with Ed May and uh, know he is like a uh, residential historian on the subject of the old uh, of Boeing City. So I just wanted to add those things. While I'm giving credit where credit is uh, due, that um, we were helped along our way with fishing uh, by a, a local fish consultant called Brian Kosminski. And so uh, Kaz, as he's known here, who uh, I think makes his full-time living now, taking people fishing. Um, But uh, Kaz is in all those creeks and rivers and uh, uh, as the stand-in, so to speak, for young uh, Hemingway. All aspects of the production that uh, I think worked in the end. Okay, so back to you, Michael. Oh, thank, thank you so much, uh, George. Robin, I see the guitar is in hand. I wonder if you could introduce uh, Gone Wild, give a little bit of uh, a backstory, what inspired it, and then go ahead and play the song for us. 
I'd be happy to. Um, in, the inspirations came, of course, from a lot of different elements, really. And um, I, I took literal phrases out of the letters and used them inside of the song, like, oh, bloody hell, oh, bloody good, he would say, oh, bloody good. You know, so you'll, you'll hear little, little snippets of his actual words kind of flying out of the song every once in a while. Um, I sort of created what I thought was going to be an appropriate film oriented verse, chorus, verse concept. And when I got it completed, um, there's a line in there that says, you know, to, I, um, to, be, to be free to wander these rolling hills. I got to tell you, George, George jumps up and he goes, rolling hills, rolling hills. We don't have any rolling hills in this film. You're going to have to take that line out of the song. And I was, was like, free oh. drones, free drones. <laughs> so it's all right there as this is all coming about. It was a miracle because the next thing I know is this just gorgeous footage of what we I've been a bird flying over this this county for a really long time. So I feel like I know what it looks like airplanes and things. But um really lovely footage. I mean, it was just mesmerized by how gorgeous all of this was. So we left in the line about the rolling hills. And then uh, we did some things like I'd said, uh, the catchphrase at the end is, um, mother, your, your boy's gone wild. But I was calling it mama, you know, and we had to go back and go, actually, he would never call her that. It's mother, <laughs> mother, your boy's gone wild. Once I got it finished, George said, okay, this last part about what happened in the war and everything, put that in the front. I'm going, oh, that's like a filmmaker thing. That's cool. All right. So we'll start at the end of where I think the story I'd like to continue to tell is. And George is right. I do have a project on Burners that is another leg of the story. And I think it's going to be very important in the long run. I think folks are going to really want to know more about that part of his life. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's truly what influenced him. And hopefully the words I captured from his words captured that. Um, usually it's a sunny day, a beam of light or something that's inspiration, so I don't know. Ooh. 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 Into the station. Broken hearted suitcase of cane. Walking shoes, harboring a little hardware and a bag of blues you'd like to leave. Deep in the wilderness, you'll leave it in. Believe it deep. There's a part of me says I can't come home, and a part that says you better take a good look in your rear view than leave it. Bloody good, blue sky above, glistening stream, beckoning, sent on the wind, leave the city behind you. Wander these rolling hills Near my heart in a moonlit bay Mother, your boy Go There's so much light Oh, this is it. 
stuff that made me thirst for wherever this rivulet roils or drift like an old man in the sea. I remain in these hills for my heart has been filled in Horton's Creek. And with and I walked a hundred miles Cause I needed to sink my toes In that gravel bottom stream The hold on my soul Feeds the stories I've told You will never let me Horton's Creek and Windermere sent on the wind leave the city behind to wander these rolling hills near my heart in a moonlit bay mother you born Gone wide, mother, your boys. Gone wide. And there's a chorus of mosquitoes up there, right? <laughs> Singing in every in every voice, the tenor, the baritone, <laughs> the soprano, and the alto mosquitoes are singing along. That's wonderful. I I think people should know that that uh, that guitar was crafted. I think it was the year that Death in the Afternoon was first printed. I oh, think right. Oh, nineteen thirty-two. I think that's what we we, we were talking. Yeah. Oh. Uh, your last line. You you discussed it, and it comes it comes out twice in the song, and I think it's elsewhere. You, you said, mother, your boy's gone wild. The Hemingway-Grace relationship really caught your attention, did it not? It, it really yeah. did. Um, I was working on this project moving forward to try to describe the life he lived in. In one of the stories he wrote home, or not, not in a story, in one of the letters he wrote home, you know, um, remember when we talked last spring about how I hope to go fishing soon, please don't burn any papers in my room and I'll kindly do the same by you. Much love, Ernie. He was up here, and he'd been hearing, of course, that some of these things are being destroyed. And I, I started to pay attention to that relationship there. I mean, they, they stay in good conversation for quite a while. But you can hear that she thinks he's a bit terse and, you know, sometimes off color. And at the same time, she wasn't around him up here when he was wandering those woods and learning some of the best cuss words you know one of the things he says it's getting lonesome here there's no one to swear with <laughs> but um i see that you know and as a mother of children as well i can understand how those relationships get tugged pulled really hard and that autonomy becomes really important but back then this toying with each other about you know it's, i need new clothes there's a trend there's a box at home i'd really like it's got my stuff in it you know letters and books please send them to me since you're burning things. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I kind of, I'm hoping to take that story apart a little bit more. Um, the thing I'm catching on to were that we, kids would come up here and in the period of time that they'd be up north, they typically take their shoes off and play all summer long. And then they'd, by the end of the summer, they'd have grown significantly. One of the qualifications to get back on the Manitou, to go back down to Chicago, to get on the boat was you had to have a pair of shoes. So in one letter, he even tells his mother that he um, hocked his shoes to get the post a note that he sent home, the postcard. But that was a big problem. People were scrambling in September and October for children's shoes. Any old pair would do, even a throwaway would do, just to get your feet covered to get back on the boat. That was, I thought that was kind of fun. I, I like the idea of being barefoot all summer, too. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm thinking back to um, the the other, you know, the the, the other big uh, documentary is 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 kind of in the air, right? The the one that 
uh, the, the Ken Burns, Len Novick, six hour, huge Hemingway documentary. And when we, uh, when we uh, s- uh, spoke with them and had a webinar uh, with uh, Jeffrey C. Ward ab- about uh, the documentary, one of the questions is ob- obviously, how do you tell a story of an author's life in six hours. And this is a different, this is a different story in a, I mean, this is a, a, the same story, but a different scale, isn't it? It's, it's 90 minutes and it's a, a different portion certainly of the author's life, but I think it's the similar question. Um, George, how do you make us uh, certain selections there? What do you keep in? What do you take out? What do you allude to? What do you emphasize? Are, if you can just maybe in little snapshots, talk through some of that, uh, editing process, some of that selection process, what comes to the foreground and comes to the background of a story of an author's life being told in, in this case, in 90 minutes and other cuts, it was shorter than that. It's not, it's 90 minutes for young Hemingway. Mm-hmm. Okay, not a lifetime, but absolutely. obviously you have to consider where that life has gone. Now I'm waiting for somebody to uh, respond with, go to part two of the story, George, and tell us about the young Hemingways in Paris. I'd love to do that if it were possible. But I felt that there was, a, in my um, medium, um, there was a lack of emphasis on what this corner of um, Michigan really meant to him. So the first questions that I I think my first um, uh, interview on the road was with uh, Paul Hendrickson, author of uh, Hemingway's Boat, a big bestseller. Um, uh, But there's maybe 40 pages about um, Hemingway and water and discovering what its importance was to the Hemingway, who would buy the boat, who would do all of these things. So um, I went to to his office at the University of Pennsylvania and the first question I asked him, and uh, Robert helped answer it today as well, but I'm talking eight years ago. Um, I went there and I said, what was he doing in Paris writing about Northern Michigan. I'm still using that term. So um, the the best substitute is up north in Michigan, I think. But, um, and he explained it, and that's how we begin the show, um, is with uh, Paul Hendrickson, and then we developed it from there. Um, And so it, for myself, I am the interviewer and producer, and then I write the narration, which links everything. So it boils down to what are the important questions? Who do you get to sit for another interview in that regard? What questions are you going to ask that person? And then it should make your life easier in the editing room um, if you get Um, good responses. So 90% of what um, I have in the interview goes away. And you get a um, a line of what we call selects. And then you build the story around it. But I I had a definite purpose there. I want some questions Answer. The other thing that fascinated me on the tail end of his time up here in Michigan is everybody coming here. And let me tell you, transportation in 1921, um, Michigan, not easy to get up here and so on. So that he didn't want to go to St. Louis Oak Park, he did it here. So that it was kind of, there's a beginning and end to the story, um, which fascinated uh, me. And I was going to ask the questions that I thought would get us there. Nobody 
said, oh, you're on the wrong track, George, or anything. And so I just merrily um, went on my way asking those questions and building a story that basically has nothing to do with my script and has a lot to do with what scholars and writers have to say about it. So this is not literary criticism. Uh, this is not uh, designed to um, give you a different uh, impression of, of Hemingway. This is a former journalist, former historian say, this is a story that's pretty unknown, except the people like scholars who have it in their head. And there's a bunch of books which write about this period, but I tried to um, do the best I could telling a story in this medium. And, um, you know, a lot of people to thank. Um, and then the, the uh, technology of the drone um, coming to my uh, aid, the music of Robin and so forth. I must say that the uh, my greatest um, reward for this it, are the spontaneous responses of um, people out there like Ernie Hemingway made um, before he died. He wrote this marvelous letter. I, I um, uh, streamed it on New Year's Eve uh, and uh, the guy who of response. I felt satisfying Ernie Mainland was really a major task for me. And then um, the head of the letters project, Sandra Spanier, came in and just, um, yeah, this morning? No, yesterday afternoon, Paul Hendrickson checked in saying that he a very short sentence, he said, you got it in there. So um, major reward. Um, and not that this is a perfect movie, but um, I have the feeling it's a pretty good one. As far as the storyline, sticking to it, I have to tell you, we did a big public premiere of the director's cut at a local um, tourist venue up here called Lavender Hill Farm. And it was great. But as I sat in the drying shed for the lavender watching the program and having always to take notes, I said, what is that doing in there? And I actually last week um, cut out two minutes. I knew you'd do that. <laughs> Continual editing. I knew that would happen. <laughs> well, but the fact is, it ain't like the old days. Digital editing makes it easy to do. Yeah. Right? Okay. And it is terrible for me, <laughs> a, a, an old a journalist who moved next door down in East Lansing. Uh, Robin, I moved next door to the newspaper office so I could get up in the middle of the night and change my story. So we have that. And um, I'm assuming that between the director's cut and the final broadcast version of this, there might be other minor <laughs> things that we put in, especially if you find some good locations in Boyne City. But I probably have said too much. I have two to three questions um, left, and one of them comes from attendee, uh, one of our uh, attendees here. How important was the Toronto Star in Hemingway's path to Paris? So we talk about um, his, his journalism. We talk a bit about um, his time in Toronto. Um, reflecting on the Toronto Star, how important do you think that was in terms of Hemingway's path to Paris? Um, well, it gave him an opera. He had written for the star since, uh, 1920 sort of freelance. And it's kind of amusing to, to, to read, like he goes to the barber college to get a free shave 
mm-hmm. and it's 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 actually pretty uh, pretty funny. But he's he's writing these feature stories, but um, it gave him sort of like a, a air of respectability yes. and yes. freedom because he's okay working in a newspaper office. He proved that working at, at the Kansas city star. But um, when he goes to, to Paris and he's sort of a roving correspondent and, and he very frequently aside from the Genoa economic conference, the Greco Turkish war and the Lausanne peace conference, he doesn't really have any assignments from uh, his editors at the Toronto Star. He's doing things. He's writing what he wants to write um, about Europe, and and sometimes they take them, and sometimes they don't. Um, so much of their their time in Paris is is through Hadley's trust fund. I mean, they can't really live on what the Toronto Star pays, uh, but it gave him another uh, avenue um, for introduction to people like Lincoln, Lincoln Staffens, uh, Bill Bird, who was the printer uh, and publisher of uh, the 1924 In Our Time, uh, who were all uh, newspaper individuals. Um, and then when they brought him back and uh, when Hadley is giving work to, uh, to Bumby uh, and he has to work in the Toronto Star offices, he lasts not even two months. Uh, and, he, and then that s- says, OK, I'm not going to be a journalist. I'm going to be a full time fiction writer now. <coughs> Well, I, I just respond with one of the highlights, of, you know, having been a reporter, editor, and even a publisher, um, that uh, I was so impressed, Robert, uh, by his, his writing style as a young man in Kansas City, in particular, because I, I, I've looked at that more uh, seriously than Toronto, I thought, wow, this, this person, if I were an editor, this person has potential. And so I do have that little section in there. Uh, um, is it Steve? Steve Paul. With yeah. Steve Paul. Steve is the guy on Kansas City and, mm-hmm. and, and Hemingway's time in Kansas City. Right. Well, I, I could not resist him reading um uh, some of the uh, writing. Now, I did not, um, uh, for lack of money, but um, I, I really wanted to um, portray and from archive footage um, Kansas City at that time, um, filled with soldiers, you know, training nearby and so on. Anyway, just a thought from. Uh, my point of view, um, the quote I left in there um, from the young man who worked with him, they take your typewriter <laughs> with you, take your typewriter. I thought, yes, yes, I can see why. <laughs> anyway, just an aside there, the total huge backstory uh, can never be told. There's too many small vignettes uh, out there for um, <laughs> this ongoing story until we lock it down and have a broadcast uh, or cable cast or platform license. So stay tuned. Keep checking younghemingway.com for updates. I I have just two questions left and and George, that's getting to one of them um, is kind of where folks can go for more uh, information and for updates. So I'll get to that um, uh, toward the end and you can fill us in on uh, kind of progress on future uh, projects. Uh, projects. A uh, first question, entirely unfair. And I know the other question was entirely unwieldy. If, <laughs> if, if, if the world were this cruel, um, what is your desert island Michigan story? If you can only choose one uh, to have uh, in your possession, what's the one story uh, about Michigan um, that you would that you would hold on to? 
essential Michigan story that Hemingway wrote. Oh, God. I know. I know, George. I told you. <laughs> you know, I never thought of Hemingway and Hemingway stories in that um, uh, in that regard, but I would have to say the one that I've read over and over again, um, at, um, trying to get a handle on him in that time is The Last Good Country. I, uh, I mean, you came out of left field on me there, um, uh, and I've never tried to evaluate them, but that's the one that really intrigued me. And, and you know, maybe not like I'm more of a city boy than uh, Robin is, but doing this film, I went tromping with cameramen all over uh, the area and uh, uh, to our east and now across a big freeway is uh, where the great rivers are, not the creeks, but the great uh, fishing rivers, the black, the sturgeon, <gasps> what's the third one? But that, that area is elk country up here um, and so on. And uh, we have the, uh, the manager, whatever the state title is for the region, walk us all over that area. So I feel like I might have been in territory that he's writing about. So I hope that answers your question. It absolutely does. And there might not be a wrong answer here. So <laughs> I, I'm hundred percent. Hundred percent. Put me on the spot, but I, I'm glad I have an answer. You got an A plus. A Rob, Robin and Robert. What about you? Um, I'll go. I have. I am oddly fond of light of the world and part of that is because that was uh, a favorite of my dissertation director um and just the it's also one of the funniest in a lot of ways Hemingway stories um <laughs> but as far as um out and out serious ones um I probably would lean t towards fathers and sons uh, and, uh, uh, you know, big two-hearted river uh, because it's just, uh, there's, there's no other story like big two-hearted river at mm. all. Mm. Boy, I'd have to agree with that, thinking of it in, in the context of it. Uh, Think too hard to do absolutely. And Robin. Well, I'm still hanging with the light of the world, you know, because it's my backyard. Um, there used to be a bar in Boyne City called the Nighthawk. It's where Mary's dress shop is right now. But there used to be a bar right there. If you were to step outside after you'd been asked to leave several times by the bartender and walked across the street, you would hit Ray Street where the two tracks for the train station were. It was an easy hop over there. So I can't go to work. I can't go to the grocery store. I can't make it to the first of the two stoplights in our town. We have two. And not think about that as a really potent location that it must have been very easy for him to be right there because he did. It's right at the mouth of the river. It's right where the lake opens up. It's at the beach. I mean, it's, it's just too familiar to me. So I hang in that one because I think that's where the bone is for me, the next step for the unfolding of the story about the true childhood of Ernest Hemingway that has yet to be told. Him wandering through town in a time when our community was losing money, it was um, dangerous, a lot of people, the guns, the booze, the, all of these things that were happening. There was a pandemic that rolled around during that period of time as well. But what he was seeing were homeless boys everywhere, barefoot, just like him, waltzing all over town, doing what they have to to survive, which probably includes illegal activities. And he's in the same age as, as these young boys and evil, easily um, confused for homeless in Boyne City. 
although he had enough money in his pocket to get out of any scrape and an uncle real close by and family and friends everywhere he could get out of trouble but he he looked a lot like the homeless people here in town but what, one of the things that mike reynolds makes in a point he makes in young the young hemingway is how much control Clarence Hemingway had over the children where he, you know, Ernest was not even allowed to have a, a library card um, up until, and how much then when you go to Michigan, he's roaming all over the place. I mean, he is, I mean, he is gone for, for weeks at a time on these camping trips and just how, you know, just that freedom that he enjoys uh, from the family uh is so good for him real good for him i see the picture often of him balancing on the edge of a train climbing the ladder on the edge of one of the <coughs> train um cars and i'm going you know that he he did that right here he did that right here he hopped here he could go anywhere he could head to calcasca he could head to mancelona he could head to chicago from there so i i see this Boyne City is being what opened up his world to exactly that freedom. He wasn't being monitored by his parents. That was really an extraordinary element. And it's walking distance. Four or five miles through the woods is an easy hike anymore. At least this little triangle. He had boats. He definitely hopped down into Boyne City a lot. And so I think a lot of what sculpted him and what he was able to then witness, a lot of cruelty, a lot of man's inhumanity against man, a lot of just... Um, the, the contest between good and evil, the contest between money and lack of it. I think he was right here in the midst of all of that. He definitely showed up in front of the, you know, the magistrate a few times. When I, I ran into town real quick today to grab the charger for my computer, and when I came back, a gray heron flies across out, out toward the lake heading kind of east and up in that direction. And I think about that, you know, that was one of the things he got in ter terrible trouble for was shooting that thinking maybe it could be what stuffed, but <laughs> not sure what he was thinking, but uh, it wasn't a good idea. He was, he was here in the midst of a lot of this court records and things like that had his name on it. And that's the stuff I'm interested in now is like, like that as a young person to see that as a way of life, you take it in, you start to assimilate that this is indeed how people treat each other. So I'm, I'm still hanging with Boyne City shaped him as much as any piece of shrapnel in his leg. Boyne City had a lot to do with that. You know, what doesn't surprise me is that Big Two-Hearted River shows up. And I think someone said, you know, there's no other story like uh, Big Two-Hearted River. But what is surprising is that it was the fourth one on the list. We had Last uh, Good Country, we had Light of the World, Fathers and Sons, and then of uh, Big Two-Hearted River, and it speaks to just how fascinating, how fantastic uh, the Michigan stories uh, really are. And uh, from uh, some audience members, uh, Three Day Blow also made uh, the list for some of them. It's, uh, my favorite description of being drunk in any any piece <laughs> of fiction in Three Day Blow. Well, I thought you were talking about a storm. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, George, you were talking about the drone shots, uh, the, the novelty of the drone shot, and someone was saying that the drone shots really helped to give them a perspective of how tragic the fishing uh, could really be. Um, and so a different perspective, a, a, maybe a better perspective on Big Two-Hearted River. Um, you know, I wanted to fin finish this off by, oh, George, you, yeah, go ahead. Right. Uh, the, the, the drone business, um, like going uh, to all digital um, camera work and editing and so on. It's an enormous change in um, uh, the industry since I started. I started my first films were all film, the real thing, uh, and then to video, um, and then to various formats of, of digital. Um, so uh, I've been blessed in that way. Um, I've been, I think my first credit um, for film was the more early 80s. So I've been at it a while. And because I treat the um, films like authors would treat books, uh, the projects tend to drag on a bit. And so 
I'm satisfied. But over the years, um, uh, I have been able to raise enough money to to say this work, uh, this can go public, and so on. But I had another goal in mind. If you look over my right shoulder. I got fairly sick of seeing Papa Hemingway displayed all over our region as the real Hemingway. So one of the things was to call out of retirement a designer who worked for me for at least several decades out in California. Tom Gould is his name, and I said, I want a young Hemingway so that I can sit and have a beer at City Park Grill, a few feet from the young Hemingway statue, and not look at the Karsh Papa Hemingway picture sitting there above the bar. <coughs> so to my friends at the City Park Grill from customer number 34, that, uh, that, that logo over my uh, uh, shoulder, over my right shoulder. Uh, I'll be bringing it in to see if you will make some changes here in the uh, upcoming weeks. Anyway, let me, thank you for letting me say that. Definitely. George, <laughs> you've, you've talked about some of uh, kind of down, down the road, future of the project, second film, if you can give us in the last uh, minute or or so, mm. what is that? What does that uh, project look like? Just a general outline. Where are where where are you in terms of uh, a second uh, film film idea? And where do we uh, go to stay updated on the progress? <clears throat> well, thank you very much for that opportunity. We are already at work. Um, three teachers are taking the director's cut and they are going to um, paper edit it for classroom use. I come to the business of filmmaking from a media education background. I got involved back in the days of Carl Sagan and uh, uh, Cosmos, James Burke and uh, Connections and other major documentaries that I educationalize um, and uh, the heart of the dragon on China. Um, I actually got to uh, um, edit the film for educational purposes. So having a very strong educational component, and I'm guessing maybe four or five modules, um, and the uh, price so that a teacher would be interested in using them. That is already in progress. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, the next thing uh, that I want to do is to find the money uh, so it's broadcast ready. And that means going in and making a lot of technical changes. One of the technical changes that I've had to deal with is the director's cut is built around a narration that um, we had from when it was a 60 minute cut. And that is because our narrator died. So I have to deal with that technical problem, uh, which makes it a little more difficult to go forward. If, for example, we wanted to say something about Robin's pet project, we would have to replace the entire narration. Um, so um, my goal is to get to the next phase. Now, the concept of uh, doing the next film, you know, this we changed the title to make it sound like a prequel to something. Uh, that would be Hemingway in Paris. Uh, I know Paris fairly well. I have a fixer uh, there who... Um, uh, could help greatly. So my goal would be uh, sometime in the near future is to write a speculative treatment of what a, another 
uh, documentary might be the sequel to this program. And I'm not uh, sitting up at night dreaming that this is going to happen. Raising money is always difficult. But having done other programs of people with big reputations, I'm amazed that Hemingway has such appeal um, to folks. We raised several hundred thousand dollars in a lot of sweat equity added there from um, those of us here in the organization. But um, it's not impossible that we could move on to the next uh, stage. There are people who uh, could help greatly in that regard, and I have not talked to any of them yet. So as far as keeping in touch, I will try to um, keep up um, uh, to speed on our younghemingway.com website. That if there are changes um, uh, and news items, that it will be there. And um, I hope those of you who are still with us um, will uh, go there and see what it has to offer. Thank you so much, George. On behalf of uh, the Hemingway Society Board and Media Committee, I want to uh, thank uh, these three guests here, George, Robert, and Robin, for a lovely uh, discussion uh, today. So thank you, uh, thank you all. Um, and thanks to all the attendees out there in uh, webinar world for making this, uh, this webinar and all the webinars uh, that you uh, participate in as wonderful as they uh, have been over the past uh, few years as we have uh, been in the uh, the midst of the uh, pandemic and transitioned as as much as we've done uh, to these virtual uh, components. Please, uh, please, please uh, keep your ear to the ground uh, for more webinar news uh, this fall. Uh, there will surely uh, be more webinars uh, coming down uh, the pipe. All right, you all, thank you so much. Thank you three for uh, uh, just a wonderful, lively discussion. And please check out the chat. We have some great uh, comments going on in the chat. So if you want to stay on for a little while and check that out, everybody have a great day and, and, a, and a good Labor Day weekend. <laughs> <laughs>